Uh, my name is Luis Alcaraz. I'm technical manager at BioRay. This is my disclaimer. Uh, I work in, in BioRay, which is a genetic lab located in, in Spain. In my lab, we work in many different aspects of medical genetics uh, using different platforms, but mainly microarrays and, and next generation sequencing. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about the protocol we developed to perform PGTM, the analysis of monogenic disorders, together with the aneuploidy screening in embryos by using next generation sequencing. This, uh, this work started several years ago uh, because at that time we wanted to, to simplify the workflow in the PGD lab. Uh, you know, this is the, the workflow. Okay, this is the workflow uh, we were using. This is how we decide which kind of test was most suitable for the different samples we received uh, in my lab. So, for example, for aneuploidy screening, we were using a combination between Arise AGH and next generation sequencing, depending on the day of the biopsy. Uh, for structural uh, rearrangements, uh, we were using again. Uh, the normal PGTA protocol, uh, if the, the aberration we wanted to see was big, if it was uh, small, then we moved to high resolution arrays. And the, the situation was even worse if we wanted to do uh, the analysis of monogenic disorders because we were using a combination, as many labs are doing right now, uh, between mini sequencing, uh, which is Sanger sequencer, and a fragment analysis by STRs. And, you know, with this protocol, it was even more difficult if we wanted to combine both things, if we wanted to do uh, the analysis of monogenic disorders and aneuploidy screening because uh, the protocol were completely different. Even the, the first step, that is the amplification of the DNA, was completely different. So, as I was saying, I was working, I work in a very small lab, so we wanted to simplify everything uh, for many reasons. The first one, okay, is this. <laughs> the first one is because, uh, as I said, we wanted to combine PGTA and PGTM with one uh, single biopsy, with one single workflow, everything handled by just one technician, uh, because this means that with this simple protocol, we are able to reduce the risk associated with the uh, sample manipulation. Uh, that also means uh, a cost reduction because you don't need so many different equipments to do different things. And at the end, this makes this technology affordable for the, for the couples. So, at the very beginning, we were trying to simplify everything, and the screen and monogenic disorders. But then they came up with uh, Reprosig, so the aneuploidy screening was done. And then we were focused on, on, on monogenic disorders. As you already know, uh, when we want to do the analysis of monogenic disorders by next generation sequencing or uh, in, in pre-implantational genetic testing, usually we need to combine two different kind of tests. The first one is the direct test, that is the analysis of the mutation in the embryos. But more important is the indirect test that is done by linkage uh, analysis. So the direct test is not always uh, possible for, because of technical uh, limitations. It is possible when we want to analyze point mutations but for example, for deletions or duplication, it's not possible to do the, the direct test. There is also a, a high risk of, of allele dropout in pre-implantational genetic testing, and usually it's done by mini sequencing. Regarding to the indirect test, uh, this is mandatory in any case. Uh, we always need to do the indirect test. Uh, to do the, the linkage analysis, the plotyping, we may, uh, always need uh, we always need relatives to do the informativity test. Uh, we analyze several polymorphisms simultaneously at both sides of the gene, and by this way uh, we reduce the, the risk of allele dropout 
and also by analyzing polymorphisms around the gene, uh, we reduce also the risk of uh, recombination. And usually it was done by, uh, by SDR. So why we need the direct and the indirect test is because mainly this one. is because of uh, allele dropout. You already know what is allele dropout. Imagine that you know this is the two copies of a gene and here we have a mutation. Usually after, after PCR, uh, we amplify both alleles simultaneously so we can detect the, the mutation. But in pre-implantational genetic testing, many times in around 5% of the cases, we have a lender pout. That means that we amplify only one of the two alleles. Uh, and this is very dangerous because if we amplify, for, as for example in, the, in this example, just the healthy allele and not the allele with the mutation, we won't be able to identify the mutation, and this is a false negative. We may think that this embryo is normal, but it's not. We have a, we have a little dropout. So, to avoid this, uh, as I was saying, we analyze polymorphisms around the, the gene, around the mutation. Uh, we try at the beginning uh, to work with STRs, but working with STRs in next generation sequencing is challenging. So we decided to, to move to a SNP analysis. So this is how it works. Imagine that here we have a gene with the mutation we want to analyze. Then we select a region around the, the gene of about two megabases. And then we select like thousands of polymorphisms to, to, to analyze. And to amplify all the polymorphisms, instead of doing manually every PCR, uh, we rely in, in AmpliSeq technology, which is great because it's a highly multiplexed PCR. In just one single tube with one reaction, uh, we are able to amplify uh, all those polymorphisms.